get on here without any problems from a technology perspective. Um, so I'm glad that worked out for you. All right, so I'm gonna jump in here. It is uh, almost seven o'clock, and so um, I will say this a couple times throughout the evening that uh, this is going to be uh, available to rewatch. If uh, for whatever reason something comes up, you gotta get off. You can check in on this later on this week, uh, later tonight. Um, if for whatever reason this I, I get cut off halfway through it, uh, I would encourage you to uh, go back and uh, watch it. Um, and and so, what is this all about? This is uh, called um, "From Good to Great: Taking Any Relationship to the Next Level." And what happened was uh, in 2011, I got called and said, "Hey, you're going to um, Philadelphia, going to a 10-day course." And um, I don't know anything else about it. You just, we had to send somebody, you're going. And so um, I started doing some research on it. And the, the course that I was going to was um, called Master Resilience Trainer Course. This was uh, taught by the University of Pennsylvania. And um, everything that I read on it, great reviews. Uh, one guy really summed it up well. And what he said was uh, that really it was a leadership course. And so what I've uh, discovered is that uh, not only was the content great for a leadership um, application, uh, not only was it great for the concept of resilience and being able to bounce back when challenging times happen, but it was also phenomenal for relationships. And so what I want to do is I want to share with you um, some of the things that, all right, let me switch the screen up a little bit. Uh, I want to share with you some of the things that um, have been shared with me as far as uh, this course. So, all right, here we go. Um, let me put these pictures back up there together. All right, I don't know if you can read this, and, I, and I'm going to try to blow this up a little bit. There we go. Okay, so this is what people, um, after sitting through this for eight hours in one day, this is what they ended up saying. Amazing training, wish I'd received it years ago. And, and I'm here to tell you that uh, if you'll um, listen, if you will apply this in your life, you will feel just like this. You'll, this is, uh, th these are things that your grandfather, your grandmother told you and taught you, but because it was somebody like that, you didn't apply it. And now you're, uh, I hope that I, I package this in such a way that helps you realize that, you know what, not only can it work, um, but it does work because you take the actions to find out about that. Uh, here was another one. Um, I learned to become a better person to be around. All right. So if you are one of those folks that uh, a little bit rough edges and um, abrasive personality, this is a great uh, course for you. Um, oh, this one, I don't know if it's, it says it explains everything about your attitude, trials, tribulation, and everyday life. That's a, a really good summation of this. And uh, yes, it does have a lot to do with uh, your attitude, but how do you control that attitude? And that is where most people, I mean, the, it, the concept of attitude um, uh, changes or controls everything about your life is, is, is somewhat valid. Um, but a lot of people just don't know how to, you know, they think that they're born with that, they inherited it, that they got it from the store and they don't have anything else to do but to act that way. Uh, here's a great one. If I apply this information, it will dramatically change my relationships for the better. Absolutely. Um, and, and really the key is the application. So what I hope is in, in sharing this with you, that you get to a point where you're willing to apply this because really that's, that's how you take the, any relationship to the next level. So if you're in a good relationship and you want it to be great, apply these skills and you'll find out that it works. If you're in a horrible relationship and you know what? You just like it to not be horrible, a little bit better. Apply these skills. Um, here is one, makes you think before you act. Um, that is very accurate here. Um, I think this holds a lot of water. I can relate to almost everything taught. Uh, this has helped me identify activating events in my life and how to overcome them. Uh, provides, oh, this is good. Provides easy to use skills that are understandable. Um, I hope that, that that is what happens for you. Provides an opportunity for self-improvement. 
that can have benefits both personally and professionally. And that is true no matter where you're at in life. If you can take this and apply it at work, you can take it and apply it at home. Uh, if you're struggling with a, a, an adult child or a young child, this will, I, these are the things that are going to help you. Um, all right, here we go. Opened my eyes to why people react to situations the way they do. Yep. And let me say this, that um, for the next uh, hour, if you would just don't think about somebody else, don't think about, hey, you know what? So-and-so needs this. And instead, just for the next hour, while I'm on this and you're paying attention, apply this to the guy in the mirror um, and see how this can apply to the person in the mirror. I think once you do that, you will understand how other people or why other people will act and react. And, and what it will do is it'll give you a lot more empathy for what they're going through or why they're behaving the way they are. All right, this is great. It's rather simple. Next line down. It's rather simple, but it seems like it'll be effective. Again, this is somebody who just had uh, sat through this for eight hours and this is what they uh, walked out with. And then uh, last thing, that I'll, I'll share here and then I'll move back. It simplifies what I'm all, already trying to do, gives me more tools to do that. So uh, this is good stuff. All right, so that is, that is my promise to you is that if you'll invest the time here, it won't be wasted. Um, if it is, I will give you all the money back that you've paid for this, all right? Um, matter of fact, I will give you double whatever you paid for this course. I will, I will write you a check. I will send it to you on Messenger. Um, you just let me know how much that was. All right. So um, from good to great, how to take any relationship to the next level. All right. And, and let me just tell you that this information here, you can find it all. Matter of fact, if you got the opportunity, uh, go on Amazon, download this book. It's called The Resilience Factor. It's written by Karen Ryevich and Andrew Shate. Um, what they espoused and in, in teaching this book is according to um, Karen Ryevich and Andrew Shate, you can increase your resilience and meaningful change is possible. And I really want you to focus on that meaningful change. All right. So remember this. Um, so, so this is about resilience, but here's what I learned. It was about leadership and it's about relationships. And so as I go through this, I want you to understand that your, um, relationships will improve when you apply these skills, your ability to lead others or the fact that others want to follow you will improve when you apply, uh, these skills and the concepts that I'm going to uh, reveal to you. Here's what's important for all of us to know. And that is this change is possible. It doesn't matter who you are, how long you've been the way you are, you can change. You can change tonight. Um, you can apply uh, the skill that I'll teach at the end of this. And before you go to bed, you will physiologically change. You will change mentally. Uh, you will change spiritually. Um, or you could be the same. You could ignore everything. You can let it go in one ear and right out the other and uh, miss it. And, and that's okay. Um, because uh, everybody, when you're ready for this, when you're ready to change and you're ready to apply this into your life, you'll find out that uh, change is possible. Well, if you want to have change, you've got to think accurately. You're going to hear me use the, the words thinking uh, more accurately or accurate thinking and then um, more effective or uh, working more effectively. I think those two are, this is where it really helped me out a lot. And then the way that we do this, the way that we bring all this together is before the end of this, I'm going to ask you to take a strengths survey. And it is through that strength survey that I'm going to show you how that um, you can get an unfair advantage. You can cheat life. You can um, cheat in your relationships in that you will help yourself uh, give yourself an unfair advantage to be able to improve, to grow, to um, help that relationship thrive. Whereas before, you might have been the person that was doing more damage, causing more harm, holding your relationship back even more than anyone else uh, involved in that relationship. All right. Uh, let me start by this. Great relationship look like this, not that. Have you ever seen those magazines, Eat This, Not That? And they'd have like a uh, uh, Eat This and it's a grilled chicken sandwich, not that. And it's a burger with bacon and cheese and probably what I had for lunch today. Um, well, great relationships look like this, not that. And here's the first one. Great relationships are about being in control of your emotions. 
Now, a lot of times when I say make that statement, uh, being in control of your emotions, and, and let me say this, if you've got questions along the way, uh, pop them in there. I'm not going to be able to see them or read them, but my uh, assistant, personal assistant, Carrie, she's sitting right across the table, and she will uh, hand me any questions that, uh, and I can stop, I can slow down, I can go back. Um, otherwise, um, I don't know. I'm just going to you know vomit this out there, and I hope that uh, you use technology to... Um, for, for your advantage and be able to come back and forth on this. So great relationship look like this, not that. And that is um, being in control of your emotions. This is probably something that most people struggle with. And when I say being in control of your emotions, a lot of people will automatically go to this assumption, being a mannequin. Oh, you, you want me to just go through life um, acting like nothing phases me, you know, that uh, nothing is uh, impacting me. And that's just not true. For you to have great relationships, you can be emotional, but you have to learn to control those emotions. You have to learn to be able to control the highs and lows. Um, how to, when you're down in the lows, to, to bring yourself out of that. How, when you're getting a little high and, and life is hitting, and um, be able to bring yourself down a little bit. So, uh, great relationships are about being in control of your emotions. Next thing, great re relationships... Um, are a brilliant strategy for seeking support versus uh, not trying to do everything yourself. There's a lot of us that think that, you know, we have to start with us, um, get it done with us, and then finish with us. And the reality is for you to be in thriving, healthy, take a relationship from one level to the next, you have to be willing to ask for help sometimes. Um, and what I find uh, fascinating is that the people who are the best at helping other people they are the worst when it comes to accepting help. And so if that's you, uh, just raise your hand and realize that a brilliant strategy um, for uh, having a greater or better relationship is to ask for help. Not trying to be the, the um, lone wolf McQuaid and going it all alone. Great relationships look like this, being deliberate not reacting too fast. I remember when I was in training at uh, Fort Riley, uh, combat skills training, we we're about to go overseas, and um, they uh, taught us uh, close quarter battle. This is where you're kicking down doors, you're going in, or, you know, there's a hostage and a bad guy, and you know, you gotta shoot the bad guy, not the hostage. And so we'd stack up by the door, we'd breach the door, uh, run in, and then, um, you know, start shooting. And so uh, what would happen is when we first started doing this, we were shooting everything. I mean, if it, if it looked like a person, it got shot. It didn't matter if it was a hostage, if it was the, the bad guys, they, it was all getting shot. And this, uh, master, this army master sergeant, uh, you know, pulled us aside and said, look, you know, th th there's a saying and that is slow is smooth and smooth is fast. And what he was talking about was, if you'll just slow down a little bit as you're going through that door, get control of your emotions, and then start processing, um, you'll still be able to shoot the bad guy and shoot the bad guy rather fast. However, um, you'll not do the bad things. You'll not shoot the hostage. You'll not um, shoot other people that are in the room, um, your team. Same thing's true in life. Uh, being deliberate, slow down, slow is smooth, Smooth is fast. Great relationships are sometimes you've got to slow things down. Maybe that significant other says something and, and your initial reaction, hey, what'd you say? And then and you go somewhere with that. Um, and the great relationships will slow that conversation down and ask questions. And I'll teach you how to do that in just a little bit. Um, great relationships are this, about getting back up, not looking like a superhero. You know, a lot of us want to go through life and act like we don't have, we've never faltered, we've never failed. And, and I would just tell you this, that, you know, there are some people, they get, went through high school and didn't have to really try very hard. Um, and then in college, life hit them, a, you know, a doozy and they never recovered from that. The reality is that for people to thrive in great relationships, for you to take your relationship from one level to the next level, you have to be willing to understand that you're going to make mistakes. You're going to fall. You're going to fall flat on your face. And what do you need to do? Get back up.
Get up and try it again. Uh, get up, create a conversation. Let other people know that you're not perfect, that, that you have um, flaws. This is probably one of the most endearing attributes that we can have in a relationship, and that is to be authentic. Um, and let them know that, hey, you know what, we, th there are areas. We got kryptonite in our life. Sometimes you got to share that with them. Last thing I, th I want to share with you, and, th and that is great relationships are a process, not a destination. Folks, um, many of you think that, it, that this great relationship is, you know, if you get there, you can relax and enjoy it. And the reality is this, that your uh, great relationship, you still have to continue to do the work. Uh, the amazing thing, though, is that once you know how to take a relationship to the next level, what happens is you have the ability to maintain that. It's a lot easier to maintain that speed, maintain that altitude than it is to get there. And so, you know, I think about this. Um, I've, been, I've taught this for a long time, I've taught this to thousands of people, and yet even when it comes to me, I, I got to realize it's a process, not, not a destination. Because as soon as I think I've arrived, I've missed it. I remember uh, one year, our uh, oldest son and daughter-in-law, they were living in Chicago. We were living over in O'Fallon, and one weekend we wanted to go see them. So we drove up, um, got there. Uh, matter of fact, I had just finished teaching this uh, course, an eight-hour course, and on... Um, uh, Friday night, we got in there about 11 o'clock. We talked to them about 20, 30 minutes. Everyone went to bed. One of the things that I enjoy about uh, going up to Chicago was we would go, I would go to the, um, there on Lakeshore Drive, and, you know, that's like 18 miles, and, and I'd go out for a, a run. I enjoyed that view, enjoyed everything about it. Well, this morning, I will, th on this Saturday morning, I woke up at 6 o'clock in the morning, and I went out to go get my car, and it was gone. Um, I woke up Carrie and asked her, hey, you know, remember where we parked the car and, you know, where she thought we parked it? Where I, as a matter of fact, we parked it in my son's parking spot. He lived in an apartment and um, everyone had their own uh, paid for spot. And well, what happened was, um, you know, he had a sticker on his car and my car didn't have a sticker, even though I was in his spot and it was okay. And so four o'clock in the morning, the... Um, Tow company drives through this had a deal worked out with the apartment complex, towed it off. Took us a couple phone calls to find out where it was at. And um, when we found out where it was at, it was it cost, I think it was like three hundred dollars to get the car back. And so I remember as soon as we picked up the car, I paid the money and I told the family, I said, look, we're not gonna talk about this. You know, we're not gonna I'm not gonna dwell on this or focus on the fact that the car was towed illegally, you know. Um, there, there were things I wanted to do, but if I would have done those things, all I would have done was got on YouTube. You know, people have been laughing at me and, hey, things not to do when your, tow gets, or your car gets towed. Well, we had a great weekend that weekend. Um, I still remember all the things that we did. And um, on Sunday afternoon, we're in the car, we're driving back south. And I don't know about you all, but when I'm driving down the road, um, I only think about one thing. And that is, I think about passing the car in front of me. And so that's what I was doing. I was just, you know, car in front of me, mile down the road. I, you know, just a little bit, uh, I'd pass it. And then, you know, mile after mile, car after car, I'm passing. Well, then I came up on these two cars and there's this one car uh, going slow in the slow lane and another car going slow in the fast lane. And I noticed there was about a five car gap in between those two. And so... Um, you know, I just, again, doing my mission in life, passing cars. And, and I'm thinking right now I got the opportunity to pass two cars at once. And so, um, I made my, my mistake and that was, I put my blinker on. And when I put my blinker on the uh, guy that was going slow in the fast lane, he sped up and closed that gap so that my, I couldn't get in between there. I don't know what happened, but I snapped. I got behind that car that was in the fast lane. I got about eight inches off his bumper and then I positioned myself off to the left so that I could see his side mirror and I could see his eyes. And, and I knew that when I could see his eyes, 
he could see my eyes and, and probably flames are coming out of mine. And, and here I am eight inches off his bumper. He speeds up, I speed up. He slows down, I slow down. He went over to this lane, I went over. He comes back over. I mean, he couldn't shake me. I was on him. I was on, you know, no more was I wanting to pass cars. I just, I, I wanted to cause damage. Well, at some point during this time frame, my dear sweet wife sitting beside me in the passenger seat, she was sleeping and she wakes up and she sees that this car is eight inches off of my bumper. And she looks over at me and she says, Ronnie, please don't. And I just said, shh, go to sleep. And so I kept following this guy. Eventually, I realized that this wasn't going to end well. That, um, you know, I, I wasn't going to get anything that I wanted. If he pulled over, I pulled over, and I beat the snot out of him. It, it wasn't going to end well for me. And so uh, I went ahead and I pulled around him, and I went on driving down the road. I knew better. You know, I thought I had control of my emotions, but here I was um, talking about this, had just taught it three days earlier. And when my car got towed on Saturday morning and it cost me $300, I did not react. I was calm, cool, and collected. But on Sunday, when I'm driving down the highway and a guy closes the gap and honks at me, I lost it. And so, for you to take your relationships to the next level, you have to understand that it's a process, not a destination. You don't arrive and, um, and it's all better. You, you'll have to continue to work at it. All right, so what I wanna do tonight is share with you seven core competencies. These are, if, uh, if you have these core competencies, if, matter of fact, the easiest way to do is ask somebody that, that knows, you, knows you well and you describe the core competency, and then give yourself a score, one to 10. One, horrible, doesn't exist, don't know what you're talking about. 10, I got this, I own it. Five, uh, I thank it, but I'm not sure. So uh, each time, so like here, for example, the first core competency about great relationships is emotional thermostat or emotion regulation. That's the scientific term. And if, if you have a good emotion regulation, obviously on Saturday or Sunday afternoon, driving down the road from Chicago, my emotion regulation, number one, all right? Had no control over it. Um, why is emotion uh, regulation uh, important? Or let me ask you this. If you knew that you could have an emotional thermostat, if it was sitting right here on your shoulder and you could, you could dial it to rage or you could dial it back here to calm, cool, and collect it, wouldn't you like to have that kind of control? Well, what I'm going to show you today and over the next couple of weeks is that you absolutely have 100% control over your emotions, even when you think you don't. When you think that, you know what? Um, I don't know why, but I just can't get control of my emotions. I promise you that you will realize that, that you have the ability to control them. I'll show you this. It's your choice if, we, if you uh, choose to use it. So why would having an emotional thermostat be important? Well, it helps you stay calm under pressure. Um, nothing worse for a relationship than to be in a pressure-packed situation and you not respond well. Matter of fact, a lot of relationships have um, dissolved or broken up because of the fact that we don't have uh, an emotional thermostat. We don't have emotion regulation. And in this pressure-packed situation, we're not calm. Saturday morning, Carrie's calm. Me, not so much. Um, Self-regulation, it's important for intimate relationships and not just husband and wife type intimate relationship, but close friends. Uh, you need to have a, um, the ability to control your emotions. And if you want to succeed at work, if you want to succeed in business, if you want to maintain a strong physical health, having emotion regulation is important. You say, well, how in the world would that factor in with physical health? Well, here's a great e example. Uh, when you are down in the dumps and it's time to go to the gym, what do you do? That's right. You stay on the couch and you get another pint of ice cream out. When uh, you have the ability to control your emotions, uh, it doesn't matter. You, you, you wrote a contract. You said, I'm going to the gym today at, at 4 o'clock. And uh, at 3.40, you're in the car driving to the gym. So emotional regulation um, or an emotional thermostat will help you, and this is a core competency. What does this mean? 
a core competency of this. If, if you took an inventory of, of people that are in great relationships, I'm going to cover seven different core competencies. And each one of those great relationships, you would see these seven well represented. Now, again, I don't want you to focus on the relationship. I don't want you to focus on the other person in the relationship. What I'd like you to do right now is just look at old number one, look in the mirror and ask yourself, emotional thermostat, how much control do you have over your emotions? One, not very much, non-existent, or 10. You know what? I've got really good control over my emotions. Uh, and the question I'm going to ask on every one of these is how can um, this core competency, how can having an emotional thermostat or having emotion regulation, um, how can it help you as a friend or as a family member? Think about the, like, what are the, the fact that you're watching this, you, you've, um, there's a relationship that you would like to improve. Whether it's good and you want to make it great or it's great and you want to make it out of this world. Or it's bad and you just want to remove some of the toxicity of that. The fact that you're here is um, proof positive that you want to change a relationship. So think about that relationship and how can have an emotional regulation, control over your emotions, help in that relationship. Write these notes down to yourself. Um, if you happen to be uh, watching this together, I mean, this is a good question to ask each other. Um, how, how has the lack of emotion regulation uh, hurt me in our relationship or hurt us? How has it, how, where are some times when I've uh, done well in my, with my emotion regulation? Because I think that we're, we're, we, um, we experience both of those. But a lot of us have a tendency to dwell on when we do bad or, or not very well at all. And so leads to uh, a lack of control of our emotions. Core competency number two, and that is the ability to shut out distractions or impulse control. Um, this is, you know, think before you speak. And uh, I think I've, I've heard uh, that we have uh, two ears and one mouth because uh, we should listen twice as much as we speak. A lot of times, impulse control, you say the first thing that comes to you. Uh, low impulse control, this is what happens. You accept the first impression. Whatever your mind tells you, uh, they're lying, they're cheating, they're no good, uh, you know, they're hiding something from me. Uh, that's the belief that you're going to latch on to, and then that's the uh, prophecy of that relationship that you're going to fulfill later on. How can having impulse control help you in that relationship that you're wanting to improve? Core competency number three is this, optimism. All right, now understand this. Optimism is the engine that drives great relationships. Have you ever met somebody that is not optimistic? Matter of fact, is not just not optimistic, but doggone it, they're just, you know, they suck the optimism out of, I mean, they, when they're walking through the house, um, you can just feel the positive energy just being drained out of everybody. It's tough to have a great relationship with somebody who um, lacks optimism. So what, what is optimism? Well, it's the belief that things uh, can change for the better. It's the belief that you control the direction of your life. I mean, when you believe that something is going to improve, um, you are going to behave differently than when you think that, you know what, it doesn't matter what I do. You just throw your hands up. So optimism is the engine. Matter of fact, I think about it this way. If you had a, a Tesla sitting in your garage right now, but there was no engine in it, what do you got? Well, you got a photo op or a paperweight. Just figure out which way you want to use it. However, if that same Tesla has the engine in it, a different beast altogether. It's, it, it's still a photo op. It's... Um, a great thing to drive around. The same thing is true for our relationships is when you have a relationship that doesn't have optimism, the engine's not there. It's not going to propel that relationship very far. And if the other person in the relationship is the one that has to bring all the optimism and you're sucking the energy out of them, um, 
you'll find out that it, it you're going to slow down that relationship and certainly going to keep it in the not so good level. All right, uh, number four, uh, core competency, and that is uh, the ability to have um, it. The, the scientific term is called causal analysis, and and I refer to it as mental gymnastics. Uh, here's that word again: accurately being able to accurately identify the cause of the problems. As I've uh, dealt with a lot of people and helped a lot of people through uh, challenging situations, more often than not, they don't see the the real reason for the problem. And, and that doesn't mean it's always them. If you're just missing the real reason for the problem, you're going to behave in a way that just doesn't work out for you. Um, you're going to be unable to assess the causes. And ultimately, when you don't know why it happened, you're doomed to repeat it. I don't know if you've ever heard of Einstein's theory of insanity, but it's this, that if you do the same thing over and over again and expect to get a different result, you're insane. I mean, think about it. If um, I had a headache and I went over to this wall and I just start banging my head on the wall and then the headache gets worse. And so what do I do? I just bang more on my head on the wall and the, the headache gets worse. Well, that's Einstein's theory of insanity. The same thing is true in relationships. Um, if you can't identify the problem in the relationship and accurately, you are, you're, you're banging your head up against the wall expecting to get a result that you're never, ever going to get. And so we have to have the ability to perform mental gymnastics. Um, I don't know if you're on here, um, Josh Cross, but you gave a great example of performing mental gymnastics in that video that you shared on Facebook the other day. And so I, I'm just going to kind of tell everybody um, uh, about this, but uh, he was talking about how that he was, um, he was being ignorant with himself. I think those are the words that he used. And what he said was that um, I, he was justifying not working out during the COVID stuff because he, f he believed that he was just as healthy as a matter of fact, in better shape than most guys his age. So I think he said he was 35 and he's, and he absolutely is in better shape than most guys that are 35. And so he's having this conversation and then he realized, he goes, man, that was ignorant because I'm not holding myself to somebody else's standard. I'm holding myself to my best self. And, and I think that was a beautiful example of mental gymnastics. The ability to see, wait a second, you know, I, the, the cause of the problem was my ignorance. Change that, empower that. And then what did he do? He gets on Facebook and he shares this with a bunch of men that um, he uh, inspires in life. Good stuff. And so if you want to have a great relationship, one of the core competencies that you've got to have is the ability to perform mental gymnastics, the ability to um, change. And another uh, scientific term is called cognitive flexibility, the, the ability to uh, see things um, accurately and truly for what they are. And if you're not seeing them accurately, if you don't see them for what the truth is, to, to be able to look, and you know what, maybe I'm going to look at it from over here and then you see a different angle and then you realize, ah, there's the problem right there and then have the ability to fix this. Now, you know, it's easy when we're talking about cars. It's easy if you're working on your bike. It's easy if it's something mechanical, something around the house. It's a lot more difficult when it comes to interpersonal relationships. And so uh, mental gymnastics when you're dealing with... Um, oh, how about this? You uh, do you have this, somebody in your life that um, like they push your buttons? I mean, they can they just they can dial you up anytime and you answer. And I don't mean literally with a phone. I'm talking about they can say things that makes you angry. They can say things and it makes you withdraw. I mean, they own you. And what's crazy is you know they own you, and you still let them do it. You you struggle with causal analysis. You struggle with having the ability to perform mental gymnastics. Why? Because you see the problem and yet you don't see it accurately. You allow it to per perpetuate even though you don't want that to happen. All right, so that is core competency number four. Core competency number five for great relationships is this social awareness. Fancy word is empathy. The ability to 
understand and interpret what's going on around you. Those people that have a high social awareness skill, you know, they can walk into a room and there's seven people there and they know who's having a bad day. They know who's just got promoted. They can tell, um, you know, when uh, somebody is like hurting and they'll run interference. I mean, social awareness is incredible. It is a core competency that if you want to uh, have a strong uh, relationship, if you want to take a relationship to the next level, is to be able to put this social awareness into practice. When we don't have social awareness, when we are low in empathy, people will describe us as bulldozers and that, that we just, we push through, we get what we want. Uh, we don't care about other people's emotions. We don't care about other people's desires. And we just, you know, go like a bulldozer. And if it destroys things, so be it. Um, we've got needs that we want to and need to get met. And so um, our lack of social awareness allows us to destroy things and, and we have no clue. I mean, have you ever seen the uh, the bull in the china shop? I don't know what that commercial was, but I mean, like back when I was seven years old, this bull would go in and wouldn't touch anything. Well, we're the bull that goes in there and everything. We move the horns. Or watching uh, on Facebook, or, I'm sorry, YouTube, uh, there's this bull named Tex, and uh, he has a long horn, and this bull just tears everything up that he gets around. He's not in a china shop. He's out in the field. Doesn't matter. Gate, he just throws it off. Um, God puts down a bale of hay and then he just like literally is picking up this giant round bale of hay that was being carried by a tractor and throwing it around the field. Um, that's what we're like when we don't have social awareness. And let me ask you this. If you have social awareness, how can it help your relationships? What are ways that when you apply social awareness, it, it helps and in, in strengthens who you are? It strengthens the relationship with uh, the other people in your life. How does it make you a better family member? I'll bet there's lots of examples of how not having social awareness, not being aware of what's going on. Um, we've looked just like texts in our living room and our sons and our daughters and our wives and our husbands, they pay the price for that. And they feel like that bell of hay that's getting thrown around for no good reason. All right, number six. So core competency. Here, let's do a review. All right. What was number one core competency? Number one core competency. I'll back it up so you can see that. And that was that you need to have an emotional thermostat. You need to be able to dial your uh, emotions up and down at will. Uh, really, we, we all have that ability. Number two was to have emotion uh, or impulse control. The ability to not just take what comes in in that instant, but really to process it and see what, you know, is it as bad as uh, it seems or uh, maybe not, not so much. Uh, number three was optimism. And I said that optimism is the engine that drives all great relationships. Uh, if you're in a great relationship right now, I promise you, not only are you optimistic, but the other person in that relationship is optimistic about um, where the relationship uh, can go, what it means, how that it's uh, mutually beneficial to uh, both of the people in that relationship. Um, the fourth uh, core competency was mental gymnastics or causal analysis, being able to um, I correctly identify the cause of the problem and instead of banging our head against the wall, instead of living out um, Einstein's theory of insanity, we have the ability to adjust. And I gave you an example where uh, Josh Cross, who um, really laid out a great example of mental gymnastics. Josh, uh, if your scale of one to 10 on mental gymnastics, you know, th on that one, absolutely, I would give yourself a 10 on that one. All right, and then uh, social awareness, I extremely important. Don't be the bull in the china shop. Don't be text. Let's see, I got a question here. Statement. Uh, Rhonda. Yeah. Um, all right, so you're already, yes, social awareness. You're already in tune with the energy in the room. Absolutely. That is so true um, because um, those that have social awareness, th they can see this. The people who don't, you know, um, right now they're like, what? <laughs> and so if you're that person that's going around, what? You know, I don't understand. Uh, social awareness, it, a right one. <laughs> All right, just circle a one on that. All right, number six, um, confidence. The uh, scientific term is called self-efficacy. And uh, this is the sense that you're effective in the world. And, and a lot of times, 
we have a um, an ability to take words and make them bad. Like, for example, uh, you know, it's bad for somebody to walk around with confidence. No, it's not. It's, it's a great thing. Matter of fact, confidence gives you the ability to have and thrive in a great relationship. Um, no. You, you just start taking inventory of relationships and, and where there's no confidence, you will see that uh, it, it's on shaky grounds and, and you struggle there. Um, what is confidence? Well, it's the faith in our ability to succeed. You know, uh, and, and this is, I was thinking this, I don't know if I said this, but, um, you know, I have made a lot of mistakes. I, and, and I would tell you this, that I probably um, come across with a lot of confidence to a lot of people. And, you know, when I was younger, that was not, uh, I, I took it to the extreme, you know, way I was, I was confident in everything. I, I couldn't fail, wouldn't fail. Well, um, when you don't have confidence, not the extreme, when you don't have the belief that, uh, you can work through this, you don't take things on and, and in a relationship, if you don't have confidence in that relationship, uh, you'll probably find a way to get out of that relationship. So people who have faith in their ability uh, to solve problems, what happens? They end up, in, they emerge as leaders. And what's interesting is that a lot of the best leaders, they wouldn't have defined themselves as a great leader. They wouldn't have said, you know, look right here. This is what a great leader looks like. They, they matter of fact, they would tell you that, you know, um, I don't even, I don't think I can do that. But then something happens. They get enough faith and then they, they, uh, tackle a, a tough, um, subject. They tackle a tough, um, a situation and, and then they do this over and over again. I was listening to a call last night and, uh, one of the guys was talking about working on a, a clay valve in, in his job and how that just a few weeks before he'd only done it once or twice. And then this one, um, he's like done nine in the last week and his confidence level is extremely high right now. Same thing in, in your relationships. When you, um, when you communicate well and you ask clarifying questions and the other person responds in a good manner, your confidence goes up. And what do you do? You ask more clarifying questions. When uh, things get a little rocky, you pull the questions out. You ask why. You've got the confidence that that is going to work out. So how can having this confidence improve your relationship? And, and again, I don't know what relationships you're thinking about out there. And, and so what I would tell you is that whatever that relationship is, uh, write that down. How can being, or, or maybe even write down where you're not confident in that relationship. All right, let me do uh, the last one. And that's this, a uh, community. Um, Reaching out, all right? And I shared with you earlier that the hard, sometimes the hardest people when it comes to accepting help are those that are the best at giving help. Pastors are the worst. You know, they, they're at the hospital. They're, um, they, they'll put anything down to go help people. But then when they need help, they don't call. They don't ask and um, go into depression because uh, they feel like they're isolated and alone. Community, you can be more effective by building strong relationships and being willing to give and receive help. Um, you know, it is uh, powerful in any relationship when the other person asks for help and then you provide it. Not, not with stipulations, not with, oh yeah, you need me now. No, um, but you're willing to, to help them truly. We find that this uh, community, this, so one of the things that, that uh, you'll hear me say over and over again is that God has put into our DNA the desire to be with and around other people. He's he just given us this desire. And, um, you know, so th there are many who will say they like to be alone. Um, and what I, I would probably argue that conversation and, um, and I would try to like define introvert versus extrovert. You know, a lot of times we think of an introvert as just the person who wants to be by themselves all the time. The extrovert, they want to be up on stage with the lights on. And the reality is that the real difference between an introvert and an extrovert is the introvert gets um, 
uh, powered back up when they're by themselves. I mean, it's okay when they're around people, a little bit draining, but when they're, uh, you spend an afternoon just reading the book or whatever it is they do, they, they get energized and, and powered up. Um, the extrovert, on the other hand, put them in a room by themselves and, you know, they go insane. Put them up in a room with 50 people and they thrive. They get energy from that. Um, so community, this is a core. You have to have the ability to bring and allow people to come into your life. All right. So how would um, asking for help or being willing to help people improve your relationship that, that you're thinking about? Again, I don't know what it is. I don't want to limit down to, you know, a lot of people will automatically just think husband and wife. And it, and it could be, but I'm here to tell you that these core competencies apply across the board. And so what I want you to do now is I want you to go back through. If you've got a piece of paper close by, you should write down these seven. Emotion regulation, impulse control, optimism, mental gymnastics, social awareness, confidence, and community. And then put a, a score one to ten. You know, one doesn't exist. 10, you, you, you're the bomb. Um, if you score a 10 across the board, uh, I'd like to meet you, Jesus. And um, please stop by my house. Uh, maybe help me with the message that I'm going to be preaching this week. Uh, I would expect that many of you will find one or two of these where you could um, put a 10 on there. Many of you are going to find a 1 um, on a couple of those. A, a lot of them, you're going to be on this side of 5 or on the other side of 5. The important, and, and this isn't a test that uh, you get a score on and you get a good grade and you get a pass. Um, this is a test. This, uh, taking a look at the core competencies of, of great relationships, the way that you score yourself. What this will do is show you where you need the work. So um, I'm about to teach the first skill called finding blessings. And um, what we'll find out is that finding blessings helps out on some of these uh, core competencies. So for example, number one, it's going to help out with optimism. It will help out with social awareness. Now, the, the truth of the matter is every one of the skills that I'm going to teach you over the next couple of weeks will help out in every one of these areas. And it depends on where you have the most need. You know, so if social awareness is off the chart. These skills are probably going to help you in another area that is a little bit weaker. Uh, I used the analogy on Sunday about uh, going to the gym and doing a specific exercise to build a specific set of muscles. And the more you do that, the more weight, more resistance you put on there, the bigger the muscle gets. Same thing is true here. You want to think about each one of these seven core competencies as a muscle. And you want more emotion and regulation? Well, there are skills that I'm going to teach you that are going to absolutely help you. In week two, will absolutely help you with your emotional thermostat. Um, next Monday night, if you watch and at the end of the night, you will have the ability to control your emotion, emotional thermostat. Uh, impulse control. Uh, in week three, I'm going to talk about um, a topic of where our uh, deeply held beliefs come from and how that they, uh, they affect our impulse control. Optimism. I'm going to cover that one, an easy one tonight with finding your blessings. Mental gymnastics next week is going to be really strong for that. Social awareness, uh, the last uh, last two weeks. Um, one is the strength survey and the other is when I talk about um, words and how we use those words, uh, social awareness is going to come in and, and really help you see things at a different level. Confidence, I really believe that as you start to practice each one of these skills, your confidence is just going to go up across the board um, in all of your relationships. And then finally, community. Um, you have to be willing to ask for help. And, and here's my promise to you all is um, reach out to me. You can send me a, a private message on Facebook. You can, uh, I'll, I'll drop my uh, uh, email. Matter of fact, uh, Kira, if you put it in there, taborrw at gmail. Um, and uh, send me an email. Uh, uh, send me a text. Um, reach out and I would love to uh, help you um, if you're struggling with uh, one or more of these things and something you didn't want to bring up in, in this uh, setting. Okay, so uh, I'm not going to ask you what those scores are. That is up to you and really what it does is it shows you, um, again, all 10s, you're cleared hot. Um, you don't have to be here in this class. Uh, if you are, if you have any one of those that doesn't reach a 10, uh, you are going to get value out of what uh, we'll be teaching the rest of this time. All right.
So core competencies, what do they do? Well, they increase your ability to handle stress. And if you got a pulse, you got stress. If you're alive, you got stress. If you're in a relationship, you've got stress. Uh, it doesn't have to be that relationship that is what the stress is. And so the core competencies are going to help you handle that stress, whether it's the relationship or external to the relationship. It's also going to help you to be able to overcome setbacks. Um, you are going to realize that you're not the only person that falls. Remember I talked about it. It's, this is about getting back up. It's not about being Superman. And so as you develop these muscles, these core competencies in your life, you're just going to be naturally gifted at handling and improving uh, relationships. And then another area that um, these core competencies help out in is uh, performing under pressure. Uh, the, the more confidence that you, that you build, the better, the more that you uh, take these skills, these muscles uh, increase, uh, the better you're going to uh, do when um, the, the pressure cooker of life uh, starts to get to you. Core competencies uh, increase your confidence. Uh, you saw that one. And then uh, decrease that helplessness and anxiety. Here's what I know. Every one of you out there have some level or, of feelings of helplessness and anxiety. Um, we all do. And it uh, may be in uh, a certain relationship. It may just be in uh, something that you're uh, facing in life. Uh, you're not alone is what I want you to hear. And so by developing these core competencies, you will decrease those feelings of helplessness. You'll decrease that sense of anxiety. And here's what I, I want everybody that's on here to listen and understand. And that is everybody can develop these core competencies. If you took that inventory and you were honest and you scored a one in every one of those areas, I'm here to tell you that um, in five weeks, you can, you can be seeing fives and tens. Uh, if you um, scored three of those as 10 and the rest of them were below five, I'm here to tell you in five weeks that you, if you apply the skills that we're going to be teaching, that you will be able to uh, uh, develop each one of those core competencies that you've recognized. So everyone can do this. You're not alone. You're not the one person that this isn't going to work on. Um, out of the 10,000 people that I've had to share this with, trust me, and, and I've got some crazy examples and stories of people who took this and uh, I'll share one with you before I uh, move on to the next one uh, because it was part of this next skill. I was working out at Scott Air Force Base. I was uh, working the gate in the morning and I remember um, this one lady because I would say, I mean, I just tried to be really upbeat when I worked the gate and say, hey, good morning. How are you? And she goes, what good about it? And, and I remember every time she came through that gate, I seemed to be the guy that was there. And I always greet her, hey, I hope you're having a great day. And even when I would recognize her and knew what she was about to say, and she was always just eating my lunch, and it was 6 o'clock in the morning. Well, one day, um, I, I taught this eight-hour seminar. She's sitting in there like second row up. She sat there the whole eight hours. Really didn't get any uh, non-verbals that she enjoyed it or hated it. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, she came up, shook my hand, said, really, this was a, a great thing. And I was kind of shocked. You know, my eyes went a little wider. It's like, whoa, you know, all right, I'll, I'll take that. A month later, I get a call. It's a colonel, a commander of a, a squadron. And he says, hey, I need you to um, meet with my squadron secretary, if you don't mind. And I said, okay. And he says, she went to your training not too long ago and, um, and she just thinks you walk on water. And uh, I recently had to, had to give her a letter of reprimand. And so um, she just won't stop talking about you. And, and I, I've seen your training, you know, it was incredible. Um, it, would you meet with her? Just try to help the situation out. And I said, well, tell me a little more about her. I said, I don't, I don't you know, I'm, I don't know who you're talking about. And then he, he it, it, it took him about 20 seconds of describing her. I'm like, oh, I know who you're talking about. And, um, and so I said, you know what? Send her over. And um, the next day we made an appointment. And she comes in the door. And she greeted me just the way she did with um, at the gate. You know, like, what's great about it? And, you know, and, and so um, since I'd known she'd been through this eight hours of training, I, I said, hey, can we do... The, that skill, finding your ble finding blessings. And um, she goes, well, I don't got anything to be happy about. And so she was holding her letter of reprimand. And I said, you know what? I said, I can show you five things about this letter of reprimand 
um, that where you can find a blessing, you can find a good thing because of this. She goes, impossible. Now, I'll admit, it, it took a little bit, um, but we worked on it. And, and, I, and, and I, saw, I, I said the first one, I said, I, I know one that's like the easiest. I can't even believe you're not saying it yet. And she goes, what? I said, um, because of this letter of reprimand, you're getting to spend the afternoon with me. Now, I knew what her boss, she had been telling the boss. And so I knew that she was holding me in high regard. And so uh, when I said that, she actually kind of broke into a little bit of a smile. She goes, mm, you know, you're right. And then uh, within a few minutes, she didn't stop at five. She talked about that uh, letter of reprimand and she gave me 10 reasons why it was a good thing. And I remember one of them. And she goes, because of this letter of reprimand, I'll never, ever get another one. All right. The light bulb had, had happened. Um, and so a great success story. Her, uh, the commander called me back up a month later. He's like, you know, I don't know what you, you, you fed her or, or what you gave her to drink, but uh, she is a different person. And what happened was she just didn't realize what she was doing. And so once she realized that, once she saw that, she was able to do those mental gymnastics and, and started applying a, a couple of those other core competencies. Well, uh, so let me uh, tell you about the um, what I hope and expect each one of us can walk away from this uh, with, and that is this, uh, that when you encounter challenges in your relationships, those challenges are local, not global. What do I mean by that term? Um, think about this way. You're driving to work and your car gets a flat tire. Now, there are some people who would allow that flat tire to ruin everything else about that day. Matter of fact, they're gifted. They would let it ruin the rest of their week, maybe even month. And the reality is that it's just a flat tire. I mean, there's ways around that flat tire. You can get that fixed. Uh, maybe it's the battery going dead or, or, or maybe... Uh, God forbid, you're in an accident and your car gets totaled. Whatever the situation is, I want you to understand that those are isolated. They're local. It's just, it's just a flat tire. It's just a totaled vehicle. It's just you got into a fight in that relationship. You don't have to allow it to apply to everything else. Now, you can... And if you do, you're going to find out that you're going to struggle with that relationship. But when you realize and you let it isolate to just what it is, you'll be able to build up all those other areas of that relationship so that um, pretty soon that it overpower whatever that just that little thing was. The challenges that you face in your relationships are temporary, not permanent. Um, and, 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 and I mean that based on every, you could be going through a divorce right now or, or maybe it was a month ago or a year ago. And I'm here to tell you that that does not have to be a permanent scar that you carry with you the rest of your life. Whatever the relationship challenges that you've had before this, I want you to understand that when they come into your relationships, they're temporary. You know, COVID-19, it's temporary. Folks, this is, as much as uh, the governor of Illinois wants it to be here for the next three years, um, it's not going to be. And we are going to overcome this. We're going to move forward and move on. And so the same thing is true for the different areas of your relationship. When you experience challenges, understand they're temporary. They're not permanent. You can make them permanent. You can take them with you and you can put that, that baggage on every day that you leave the house but you don't have to. And I hope I'm going to give you that freedom to walk away from that today. And then the last thing I want you to understand is that whatever you're dealing with, it's within your span of control. Now you may believe that it's out of your control. And I'm just, I'm here to tell you, I don't know that there's anything that you're facing right now that's not within your span of control. Maybe that's one of those conversations you'll want to hit me up on a direct message and, and allow me to you know, prove to you that you do have some control in that situation. Okay, um, I, I wanna do finding your blessings and I'm gonna close this down. So I've been on here uh, almost an hour now. And, um, and so this past Sunday, I preached a sermon about finding blessings. And in, in the Bible, we talk about the, the term counting your blessings. Why there's a hymn out there about it. count your blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord has done. So what I want to do is I just want to show you that in Scripture, 
Scripture is full of Bible verses. I don't know if you can read these, but this every one of these Bible verses that you see written uh, the the over here in blue, right? uh, Romans eight twenty eight, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to His purpose. Uh, Ephesians five twenty, giving thanks always for everything to God the Father and in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Psalm fifty twenty three, the one who offers thanksgiving as a sacrifice glorifies me. So you cannot separate um, from the Bible. Uh, without uh, realizing that it places high regard for it places high regard on gratitude and so um, science tells us that gratitude is good it helps us it helps with our he health it improves um, our ability to sleep it, it helps us in so many different areas and all science is doing is catching up to what the Bible said you know, so you go out there and Google verses on gratitude, verses on hope, verses on um, Thanksgiving, and you're going to find out that the Bible, I mean, from cover to cover, it talks about being thankful, giving thanks. But here's what I have realized is I can tell you that, you know what, you need to be thankful and you don't do it. You know, Colossians 3.15 said that, and be thankful. And yet many people struggle with that. And what, what I have, have observed is that They'll be thankful for like five seconds and then they'll go back to the pity party for the rest of the day. And so what I want to do is I want to teach us a skill. And if there's any interest, I would love to get on a Zoom call after this and then actually go through this skill with you. Uh, we've done this as a family. I love it. Matter of fact, uh, our kids took us out for our anniversary in April. And uh, when it was done, at the end of the night, we ended up at Starbucks. Uh, my wife and daughter-in-laws love Starbucks. And so um, uh, one of my daughters in law said, hey, would you like to do that thing that uh, we do as a family, which is finding blessings? And so I said, I would love to. And, uh, you know, my, my sons were acting like they hated it, but um, I believe that uh, they love it. And what you'll find out is if you'll, this is a great thing to do at the dinner table. Um, if you'll go around the room uh, with this, and, and let me just show you what it is and how it is, and then I'll kind of bring back to how to how to apply it. Here's our problem. Here's um, you know we have a an, a a thing called uh, hedonistic adaptation. Um, you may have read about the hedonic treadmill, and what that means is you get used to a certain level of and, and um, it, it might be a standard of living. It might be a house. It might be a car. It might be a certain expectation relation, and then you get comfortable with it. And, and, and it's an expectation, you know, it might be something that like three years ago, just wowed you every time, uh, you, uh, walked in and saw that you're like, wow, incredible today. It doesn't do that anywhere. And that's that, that's that hedonistic adaptation. You come to expect that. Um, I encountered this with a vehicle I owned. It was a suburban Chevy suburban. And I bought this. It was um, the the package that had the leather, electric. I mean, it was wonderful. Love this vehicle. Matter of fact, I kept telling myself, you know, how in the world did I ever live without this vehicle? Well, as you can imagine, three years later, you know, I wasn't wondering how in the world did I ever live without this. You know what I was wondering? You know, how much can I get for it? And so... The reason why we want to practice this skill called finding your blessings is to realize that, um, you know, if you don't, you will level off and you will see things that are great and phenomenal in your life and you won't recognize it. Why? Hedonistic adaptation. Um, there's another little special uh, something, something in a lot of our lives, and that's called negativity bias. Boy, we have, this is, you know, if you've heard me say that we have the ability to find the cloud with inside the silver lining. You know, everyone else is looking for the silver lining. You, all you see is the rain cloud. And so um, negativity bias does that. And, and we see, um, uh, if you think that uh, somebody doesn't like you, you'll see behaviors that they're doing that convince you that they don't like you. If you think that this is about your boss or, or, or a coworker or a family member or um, uh, someone else, another relationship that you have, uh, you'll find what you're looking for when it comes to negativity bias. Uh, there's also confirmation bias that uh, we have, and, and what that does is it gives us the ability to see what we want to see. And so um, have you ever thought about this? 
you go and buy a new car. And after you buy the new car, all of a sudden you start noticing all of those types of cars on the road. You know, like before you bought that car, you didn't notice that everybody else was driving the same car. Well, that's confirmation bias. We start seeing what we're looking for. So if you, a confirmation bias, um, you will see and if, uh, if you want a reason not to go to the gym, confirmation bias will give it to you. As a matter of fact, you'll have seven of them before the hour's over. Confirmation bias allows you, and, and it's unhealthy. Um, and so what, what we want to do is we want to apply this skill, finding your blessings, so that we can grow our optimism muscle. Remember, optimism is the engine that drives healthy relationships. Because I'm here to tell you, hedonistic adaptation going to hurt your relationships. Negativity bias, not good. Co um, confirmation bias, you know, all your confirmation bias, you're giving yourself self-fulfilling prophecies. And, and then you go out and create whatever it is that you think is going to be bad. Okay, so what do we do about this? Well, um, you'll find out that if you will practice this skill, finding your blessings, here's some things that are going to increase. Number one, better health. You're going to find out that your blood pressure will get better. You, now, look, I'm not just telling you this stuff. I'm not making this stuff up. Um, I'm, I don't have the citations down here, but there are um, studies with the empirical evidence that demonstrate that if you have the ability, and this is why when you go through Scripture and you see where it talks about being thankful, when you have the ability to truly be thankful, you're, you have better health. You are able to sleep better. And you will find out that when you're able to give thanks from a joyful heart, that you have better relationships. And ultimately, when you, when you combine better health, better sleep, better relationships, whatever you're doing, whatever job you're assigned to, whatever your um, task that you're taking on, you'll find out that you perform better in that. So here's how you do it. It's so simple. Matter of fact, um, I'm going to uh, drop in the comments here after I get off here a link, um, and you could download and, and print this card, and it has four on one. But here's what the skill of finding blessings is, and that is list three good things that have happened in your life in the last 72 hours. All right, so it is Monday at 8 p.m., and so go back Sunday, Saturday, Friday. So since Friday at 8 p.m., write down three good things. Three, three good things. Not one, not two, but three good things. All right, there's importance in why we write down three. And then what I would encourage you to do is answer these four questions. They're very simple. What or why did this blessing happen? What does this blessing mean to me? What can you do to enable more blessings like this? And then how did you or other people contribute to this blessing? Now, um, I was talking about community as one of the core competencies. And I remember uh, there was a, a young um, NCO um, in the Air Force. And, and then she shared with the group, she was going through this course, and she shared with the group about this skill and how that it had improved her team. So every morning she started off with finding your blessings and she would go around the, so there's seven different people that work for her and she would ask, have them give three good things every day. Like this is the way they kick things off. And then on one day, one of the girls shared and it, um, it, it didn't seem like a blessing at the time, but she shared with the team how that her grandmother had recently passed away and that it was because of the this group that she was in and, and this finding the blessings that um, she actually took that that tragedy, that heartache and was able to uh, see good in it because um, one, the, the, this uh, young NCO, um, the way that she um, loved on her team reminded of her of her grandma. And so... I mean, you can imagine being a part of this team when this young lady shares this and how much stronger the team got because of something as silly as that. I've seen this where families, I watched one um, family uh, go through this and um, where one of the daughters shared with the family one of her blessings was that they got to go swimming in the pool you know, because they'd put in a new light and um, it was at night. 
And so mom and dad and the other sister and her were out there swimming. You know, I mean, this was a story that this family shared with me uh, nine years ago. And to watch that family bond over that and to relive that blessing that was in their life. I'd encourage you to um, write these questions down. You know, chat, next time you're at a meal with family, put the cell phones down and then say, hey, let's find our blessings and ask them to find three good things. And, and here's how I do it is I just go around the room. You know, everyone gets one. And then when they, they, they tell me the one, and then I ask the four questions. This past Wednesday night, there was uh, eight of us in, in uh, uh, a meeting. And so I was talking about this. And so we did this and, and everybody shared a blessing. And then I just asked the four questions. Um, I like going and doing uh, all three of this. And here's why, because some people uh, on the first one, they'll throw up softballs, you know, like I'm alive, you know, uh, it's not raining, the sun's shining. But uh, pretty soon they run out of stuff like that. And then they start really sharing the blessings that are in their life, the, the good things. And it, it amazes you, moms and dads, when you do this with your kids, of what they're seeing and what they're finding value in. It will amaze you when uh, you hear from your brother or your sister about something that you didn't even think twice about, but you had done and it blessed them. And it was something that out of all the good things that they could have mentioned, they brought that activity up. Okay, um, one of the things when it comes to finding blessings that has really, really helped me out is that I use technology to help. If you heard, I talked about how that um, I struggle with uh, writing in journals. And so I came across this app, and you can see a, a picture here of it um, called Day One. And so uh, right there is a picture of the Ocean Springs um, Bridge. It goes from Biloxi over to Ocean Springs. And you can see the date on there is March 24th, 2013. I remember that, I mean, right now, as I'm thinking about this, as I see that picture, I remember that that whole weekend. We had driven down to um, Biloxi because uh, one of my uh, closest friends was in the very last, I mean, he had probably three weeks left to live. And so um, as, as I look at that picture, I remember like in the room having conversations with um, Howard and, you know, he knows that he's close to uh, going to heaven. Uh, I know that when I leave this weekend, I'm not going to see him again. But the reason why this, the picture of this um, bridge and the sunrise is because uh, at the time, Carrie was getting ready for a um, half marathon. And so uh, she was uh, running a lot. And one of the things, we had lived down here in Biloxi for 10 years. And one of the things we'd never done was uh, run over that bridge. And so um, I told her, you know, when we were driving down, I said, I'm going to run the, the bridge with you. And so because of our schedule, uh, we had to do it. I know it says 11.59 a.m., but that was uh, like 5.30 um, a.m. in the morning. And so we went over there. We ran the bridge. It was a phenomenal weekend. Um, it, it was a great, uh, th the conversations that Carrie and I had um, on uh, part of that run, um, the, the weekend with Howard and Joan to just be able to love on them. Um, and it, like, so here, here's what I would really encourage you to do is find, and this is, uh, for you as an individual, uh, use pictures. You could pull up your cell phone right now and just go through the pictures and you, you'll be amazed at the memories that start coming back. And if you're able to answer those four questions, like why did that blessing happen? Um, what does it mean to you? Uh, how can you enable more blessings like that? And then ultimately, what did you contribute and how did other people contribute? Here's what's fascinating about taking pictures and why it's important. The human brain thinks in pictures. Computers thinks in uh, ones and zeros, uh, a, a binary, a digital environment. The human brain doesn't. We think in pictures. That, that's why if you uh, open up a phone, And if you look at it, you see all these pictures. We call those icons. And so um, I, can, I can just show you an icon and you can tell me the program, um, what that is. And th that's because that's the way your brain thinks. So if I showed you this icon and it had a blue W, most of you would know that that was Microsoft Word. If I said a green E, you'd tell me it was um, Excel. If um, I showed you one with a, a blue background with an F on it, you'd tell me that was Facebook. Why? Because our minds um, 
things stick to us. And so uh, just like as I look at this picture and I'm, I'm immediately, I'm back in Biloxi, I'm sitting in the room with Howard, I'm driving um, at 5.30 in the morning to go on this run across this bridge with my wife. That's the power of, uh, of pictures and I would encourage you somehow uh, when it comes to finding your blessings to be able to uh, utilize this. I could pull up day one and now I've got um, nine years worth of memories. And so I love it. All right, so take a picture of it. Uh, Facebook is another uh, place that you'll see people um, talking about their blessings. I, You know what? I don't see too many people putting on. Now, there are some, all right, so so don't start tagging me in all these posts of, of, of negative Nancys. Um, but for the most part, you'll see posts of people of celebrating, bragging, and really what they're trying to tell you is, hey, this was a blessing in my life. So, okay, um, that is... Almost everything. All right. So let me just do this in summary. And I think I've got two or three slides left. And remember, why do we want to do this skill? We want to build this muscle of optimism because optimism or positive emotions, they override the negativity or confirmation bias. They um, help us overcome the hedonistic adaptation where we just kind of get used to it. We have a great thing and we just get used to it. Um, it also helps us to habitually, all right, identify gratitude and express this in our lives. Um, if you'll do this, if you'll learn to practice this, finding your blessings, it will literally change your mindset. I shared with you guys the story on Sunday about a mom and we're sitting across the table at dinner and this mom was struggling with depression. And she is telling herself over and over again that her daughter doesn't like her, her daughter doesn't think she's a good mom. And so, um, now I could tell her that she's wrong. I could have told her that, you know what, and, and proved to her that there's no evidence out there for this. But that doesn't work. And so instead, what I did was we did this exercise. And Carrie was uh, sitting right beside me when uh, this happened. And, and here, I, here's what I just want to share with you. Is that, and, and this is a personal example, and then I'm going to give you the, the scientific data. And that was, she went from, and that I'm referring to this mom that was sitting across the table and having dinner with us, she went from not being able to really hold a conversation and finish a sentence to, uh, I mean, the change was absolutely amazing. By 30 minutes of this, and um, I mean, her just whole outlook on life was incredible. Well, here's what the, the scientific data tells us, is that if you take somebody who is um, clinically depressed, uh, they could be hospitalized for the depression and on medications for it. So these three things, clinically depressed, hospitalized, and taking medications. If they can do this skill, finding your blessings, and if they can do this for 30 days, they get off the meds, released from the hospital, and they're no longer considered clinically depressed. I mean, this is powerful. Um, it, it's This is why the Bible tells us to be thankful, to, to give thanks. And it says it over and over and over again. And I'm here to tell you that one of the most powerful ways that you can help any relationship go to the next level is if you will learn how to find the blessings. And I, and I just want to tell you that he, sometimes people, when I say this, find the blessings, they, they're immediately looking for great things. And um, I believe, and I've seen this over and over again, that there are blessings in the pain. There's blessings in the rain. There's blessings in the hurt. And we just have to have the ability to find that and discover that and um, pull that out. And when, when you get to that ability where that not just can you find the good things that are just laying around, but then sometimes you got to dig and, and you can find the good things even in the things that are hurting. You know, maybe you're in a broken relationship and there's no chance for it to get back together. What, through that process, um, have you gained from it? There's the blessing. What have you learned or how are you going to change because of that? There's the blessing. And so, uh, you know, you can do this. Uh, all of us can. All right. How do we uh, do uh, finding your blessings? Remember this. you got to ask the questions, all right? And here's why. If I tell you to think about something, all right, for example, a Bible verse, you know, think about this Bible verse. What you'll do is you'll re repeat it like four or five times, 30 seconds later, 
um, you don't think about it again and you spend the rest of the day focusing on everything that's going wrong in your life. Here's what happens when you ask these questions. Asking the questions forces you to disengage your mind on those negative areas and focus on this positive, this blessing, all right? And here's what these four questions help lead you to. And number one is that your blessings are not freak accidents. A lot of you convinced yourself that, you, you know, when a good thing happens to you, you're walking down the street and then you trip over it and, oh, oh look at that, that's a blessing. Um, it's incredible. On the other hand, I'm here to tell you, it's, that is not the case. Those are not freak accidents. Um, all right, I'm trying to get a glass of water here. More mouth in. Woo! All right. Um, and so, I shouldn't have done that. Uh, and so, um, blessings are not freak accidents, all right? That was a blessing that just happened. Um, here's why else you ask those questions. You'll find out that whatever you wrote down as the blessing, it means something to you. And most of you are going to say the world. It means the world to me. And I, I think you're right that it does mean the world, but it means more than that. And what you really want to do is be able to define what is that because it's more than just the world. I also want you to realize that you had a role in the blessing, whatever it was, whatever you put down on there. You're, you had a significant part in, to play in why that blessing happened to you. And not only that, but other people had a role in that as well. And so really that's where that community comes back into, having other people in your lives. All right, I've talked for a long time. Um, I am going to uh, shut up. And what I would tell you is uh, if you've got questions, if you'll type them in, um, I will answer them. If you type them in and I see them before um, I get off here, I'll answer it verbally. And if not, I'll get back on here and I will... Um, answer it with um, a, a written. Kenny, I see that uh, I miss running across I-10. So Kenny uh, is uh, our cousin, and when we lived down there in Biloxi, Mississippi, he's a truck driver, and he would be he would stop, and um, I'd go up, and we'd go up and pick him up and have dinner with him, um, bring him to our house, or go out to dinner. So uh, yeah, Kenny, those are good times. Where's that? We talk about blessings. Come on. Uh, yeah, I still remember uh, driving around the parking lot to get to you. Okay, guys, uh, thanks for investing some time in this. I hope that you found value in it. I hope that you will go back and listen to some of the areas that um, uh, were resonating with you. And I hope that you will practice this skill of finding blessings. Um, right now, uh, with uh, whoever's there with you, I'd uh, you know go back, freeze the frame on, um, find three good things that have happened in your lives the last 72 hours. And, and here's the, the secret. It doesn't have to be 72. It could be 24. It could be 10 years. Um, because when you start thinking about it, when you ask, go through those questions, you're back in the moment. Whether it was 10 years ago, whether it was three days ago, whether it was two hours ago. Okay, guys, um, I'm going to drop off here. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope that you will uh, tune in on Sunday because the sermon I'm preaching is called Stinking Thinking. And we are good at this topic of stinking thinking. I'm going to show you how that uh, in Scripture that y you do not have to. I mean, the Bible lays this out so crystal clear. And then next Monday night, i um, probably going to share one of the most powerful, life-changing, transformational um, opportunities with you. And you will be able to walk um, with more confidence in the relationships because you're going to start understanding um, about uh, what's going on around you a little bit better. Okay, I'm uh, closing this down. Love you guys. And again, I hope this was uh, a blessing for you.